So I have talked about this before. These are um, something that I think if you read the foreword of the, I don't know, volume one, uh, he would talk about this as a kind of, um, yeah, foreword. Oh, preface, sorry, foreword is written by someone else. If you read the preface, then he would describe where it comes from. So this came from uh, um, lower division, introductory physics, introductory in the sense that these are the first physics classes that um, science and engineering majors take at Caltech. Um, and he gave these uh, lectures um, the first uh, three semesters, I think, um, that's what volume one, two, three divisions are. And um, I guess, does it tell you the year? It was done in the 1960s, yeah. So so that's where it comes from. And, uh, and I think I've said this a couple of times that you can't really use this as a textbook uh, for a class because the orders are so unusual. You know, he's talking about conservation of energy long before even introducing kinematics. And um, so, so, so with that caveat, it is a classic. It's uh, something that, um, so if you ever major in physics, it's something that many of your physics professors would have read or at least heard about. And um, from my personal perspective, I um, I think the first summer <laughs> when I was in college, uh, I spent the first few weeks of the summer just reading through the book and um, the volume one. And I remember just uh, uh, getting a, a really fresh perspective, understanding the laws of physics and um, the physics problem solving in ways that um, that I didn't quite get from the textbook that we were using then. So, so this is a kind of supplemental um, thing because it, it um, gives that perspective. Now, one thing I do have to say is that, you know, it's from the 1960s. So um, to the extent that there have been uh, progress in physics, fundamental physics, or engineering, uh, that wouldn't be reflected in this book, uh, especially in the fields of engineering. Uh, with the fundamental physics, um, both of the, <laughs> I, I usually cast it as a discouraging thing. Um, there haven't been any new fundamental uh, paradigm shifting discoveries in physics since about 1980s or so. That's when what we call standard model of particle physics was um, completed and then since then there have been particles discovered there have been discoveries but none of the discoveries since then changed the paradigm of how we are organizing things um, so so to that extent the encouraging thing here is that a lot of this is kind of up to date because it's the sort of thing that doesn't change so anyways um so I had a couple of sections picked out that I wanted to just uh, read through. Uh, yeah, chapter seven. Um, uh, the, I <laughs> remember. I think this was when I was teaching astronomy. Uh, there was a um, uh, story about Newton and his discovery of law of universal gravitation that um, that I remembered from somewhere that I was uh, looking for um, uh, kind of. Uh, authoritative reference to to cite it properly in my lecture slides and um and, and it's here so so i don't think i would uh, well, let's see do i want to read it through the whole um uh, chapter well let me do it this way um i'll just briefly summarize the uh, first uh, a few sections and then read it through the one section where that contains the excerpt that I'm looking for. Uh, this, by the way, is the board picture there, just uh, uh, putting it there as a kind of decoration for the page. Um, so in section 7.1, uh, he's talking about planetary motions. Um, so it, it 
he starts out with a summary of um, what we'll get to in a bit, the Newton's law of universal gravitation. Uh, this is the inverse square law statement about the gravitational attraction between everything. Now, uh, there's a story of getting to this law because it's uh, um, us uh, modern folk, folk. So we have the advantage of standing on the shoulders of giants, <laughs> um, uh, benefiting from all the work that have been done, all the observations that have been made. So we have the luxury of uh, starting from this law if we want it to. And um, in this and the next couple sections is where Feynman tells the story of getting to this law. So we start out with the planetary motions. That's a, uh, well, I like to draw this distinction between the laws describing planetary motion and Newton's law of universal gravitation. Because, um, so the first thing that uh, led people to think about um, what led to uh, the law of gravitation is observing motions of planets, motions of planets among the stars, and um, trying to come up with the theories that would account for all the features you see in those motions. And uh, he skips through some things. Um, he's skipping through like Galileo and all the stuff. Uh, he's beginning with the, the beginning of modern astronomy, which is the observations of Tycho Brahe. He observed um, a planet for over a couple decades, 20, 25, 30 years, and uh, after realizing that that what was really lacking was um, quality of existing observations. So he gathered the data uh, for that law, looking at the stars in the night sky. And what he was interested in was not the stars, but the, the planet. Well, maybe stars, too, but what turned out to be important was his uh, measurement of position of planet. And Kepler is the guy who analyzed Tycho's data and um, as he was analyzing it, he was able to derive the follow, or he was uh, able to deduce the following laws. Uh, these are um, what we might call a phenomenological law, in that he his starting point was data. So Kepler's first law, we covered this by the way. Kepler's first law says that planetary motions are um, uh, take an elliptical path and. Um, how did he know that? Well, he uh, looked at this data. He first analyzed it under the assumption that it might be a circle and turned out it didn't really fit if it was a circle. So he started thinking of other shapes that might be similar to circle, but still fits. And what the shape that worked out turned out to be ellipse. And now if you were to ask a Kepler, so uh, why does it go in an ellipse? He wouldn't, I imagine, he wouldn't have an answer because he. this is what he discovered in his data. But the thing is, the data doesn't tell you the reasoning processes for uh, uh, arriving at that conclusion. That's uh, the work of the theory. And, um, and Kepler's second law uh, deals with how the speed of the planets vary as, go around, as they go around in this ellipse. Uh, this is the picture that demonstrates it. And the third law, I think it, there was about a gap of 10 years between his first two laws and the third law. Uh, it, it deals with uh, um, uh, comparing different planets. Uh, he found out the planets that are farther away from the sun move slower. Um, there's a whole mathematical statement here and what this mathematical statement um, uh, boils down to is that planets that are farther away, they, they do take longer to orbit, uh, for one, uh, but if they were moving at the same speed as the inner planet, then they would at least uh, um, be, you know, uh, the relationship here would be proportional. And it's not proportional, but there's this factor because planets that are farther out uh, move slower. Now, um, so we have these Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, and I call this beginning of modern astronomy because these laws are still today true, uh, with the caveat that it's true to the extent that the sun is the only source of gravity in the solar system, uh, which is, you know, 
to a larger liquid approximation. Um, so under that approximation, Kepler's laws are still true. It's not like the Copernican uh, heliocentric model with the perfect circles that we had to get rid of. Kepler's laws are still true with a very specific bit of approximation. Um, but as a law of physics, what it lacks is it's describing a very particular category of object. And, um, and physics being fundamental science, we think there's a fundamental law that describes everything. And having a law of planetary motion that somehow doesn't apply to terrestrial objects, that's, um, that's not satisfactory. So this is where uh, he takes a little bit of break in 7.3 to talk about Galileo, well, not Galileo, talk about <laughs> Newton, <laughs> well, Galileo and Newton. I, I think the way to usually taught um, the, we, at least I teach it out of chronological sequence. So Kepler was a contemporary of Galileo. In fact, uh, when Galileo, um, there is a letter that Kepler wrote to Galileo as Galileo was uh, writing and advocating for heliocentrism. Um, so uh, Tycho Brahe is actually, uh, he's not contemporary of Galileo, he comes before Galileo. And um, so, uh, so we talk about Galileo more when we talk about uh, like inertia, uh, principle of relativity, and that stuff. Yeah, um, and and then uh, Newton it comes later after Galileo, after Kepler, and Newton's laws of motion are what we spent quite a bit of time um, working through this semester, and this is what he describes. And uh, this is the section that I want to read in more detail. So, uh, so as we get into this section, so uh, what we should have understanding of is the the discoveries of um, Tycho Brahe and Kepler, their um, their their description of how the planets move, and development of some basic mechanics, uh, Newton's three laws of motion, describing force, mass, and acceleration. So. Um, so this is the the culmination of all that understanding and knowledge. So section 7.4, Newton's law of gravity. Oh, so by the way, I'm just gonna basically read through the section. I figured I would just do that. Um, do I want to? Yeah, I, I think I'll just have it there and I'll just read it through. <laughs> so it says, um, from his better understanding of the theory of motion, Newton appreciated that the sun could be the seat of organization of forces that govern the motion of the planet. Newton proved himself, and perhaps we shall be able to prove it soon. Um, and by the way, it's a quite, um, um, you have to be really good at calculus to be able to prove this. That the very fact that equal areas are swept out in equal times is a precise signpost of the proposition that all deviations are precisely radial. That the law of areas is a direct consequence of the idea that all of the forces are directed exactly toward the sun. Oh wait, so that is actually um, something that relates to the, the angular momentum and torque. So maybe that you don't have to be so good at calculus to prove that. <laughs> going. Next, by analyzing Kepler's third law, it is possible to show that the farther away the planet, the weaker the forces. If uh, two planets at different distances from the sun are compared, the analysis shows that the forces are inversely proportional to the squares of the respective distances. Or back up there, the formula that we had, it's uh, so much shorter to state it in mathematical expressions. With the combination of the two laws, Newton concluded that there must be a force inversely as the square of the distance, inverse of square, directed in a line between the two objects. 
Being a man of considerable feeling for generalities, Newton supposed, of course, that this relationship applied more generally than just to the sun holding the planet. It was already known, for example, that the planet Jupiter had moons going around it as the moon of Earth uh, goes around the Earth, and Newton felt certain that each planet held its moons with a force. He already knew of the force holding us on the Earth, so he proposed that this was a universal force, that everything pulls everything else. Um, this discovery, by the way, was by, um, by Galileo, and it was one of the discoveries that supported the heliocentric idea, heliocentric model, and refuted some of the objections to the heliocentric model. The next problem was whether the pull of the Earth on its people was the same as its pull on the Moon, i.e. Uh, it has, that is, <laughs> inversely as the square of the distance. If an object on the surface of the Earth falls 60, uh, 16 feet in the first second after it is released from rest, um, this, by the way, is a summary of um, uh, the mechanics thing that you learn. The, I think the gravitational acceleration in the imperial unit is 32 feet per second squared. So when you work out the kinematics for one second of falling from rest, it'll work out to be 16 feet. Um, you can do the kinematics yourself. But if there were no force on the moon, it would, uh, wait, 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 uh, from the rest, how far does the moon fall in the same time? We might say that the moon does not fall at all, but if there were no force on the moon, it would go off in a straight line, whereas it goes in a circle instead. So it really falls in from where it would have been if uh, there were no force at all. We can calculate from the radius of the moon's orbit, which is about 240,000 miles, and how long it takes to go around the Earth, approximately 29 days, how far the moon moves in its orbit in one second, and can then calculate how far it falls in one second. Oh, I don't know what this is. Oh. Yeah, so this is the footnote describing what falling means. Um, so how far, how, <laughs> oh, let me just leave that there. Uh, how far the circle of, uh, so if you imagine a straight line path and compare that with a circle, there's a distance there. That's the distance that's being described as falling. This distance turns out to be roughly one twentieth of an inch in a second. That fits very well with the inverse square law because the Earth's radius is 4,000 miles and if something which is 4,000 miles from the center of the Earth falls 16 feet in a second, something 240,000 miles or 60 times as far away should fall only one uh, 3,600th of 16 feet, which, is, which also is roughly 1 20th of an inch. Wishing to put this theory of gravitation to a test by similar calculations, Newton made these calculations very carefully and found the discrepancy so large that he regarded the theory as contradicted by facts and did not publish his results. Six years later, a new measurement of the size of the Earth showed that the astronomers had been using an incorrect distance to the moon. When Newton heard of this, he made a calculation again with the corrected figures and obtained a beautiful agreement. Um, oh, and this is just the apparatus that describes how far something falls, not necessarily in a second unless you set up the dis distance and the speed so that it's a second. But, uh, uh, so our version of this, you, have, you might have, uh, in one of the assignments you have seen the shoot the monkey demo. <laughs> that's this demo, except here he's not shooting, he's just letting it you know, launch horizontal. The idea that the moon falls is somewhat confusing because as you see, it does not come any closer. The idea is sufficiently interesting to merit further explanation. 
The moon falls in the sense that it falls away from the straight line that it would pursue if there were no forces. Let us take an example on the surface of the Earth. An example released near the Earth's surface will fall 16 feet in the first second. Oh, yeah. So it's a... Uh, uh, let me try doing this. Uh, open image in your tab. Yeah, and let me try having this on the side so that we can read and both see the description of the... Yeah, so in this uh, coming section, he's describing this apparatus. He, I refer the moon falls in a sense. Okay. An object released near the Earth's surface will fall 16 feet in the first second. An object shot out horizontally will also fall 16 feet. Even though it is moving horizontally, it still falls the same 16 feet in the same time. Figure 7-3 here shows an apparatus that uh, which demonstrates this. On the horizontal track is a ball which is going to be driven for the little distance away. At the same height is a ball which is going to fall vertically. And there's an electrical switch arranged so that at the moment the first ball leaves the track, the second ball is released. That they come to the same depth at the same time is witnessed by the fact that they collide in midair, collide here. An object like a bullet shot horizontally might go a long way in one second, perhaps 2,000 feet, but it'll still fall 16 feet if it is aimed horizontally. What happens if we shoot a bullet faster and faster? Do not forget that the Earth's surface is curved. If we shoot it fast enough, then when it falls 16 feet, it may be at just the same height above the ground as it was before. How can that be? It still falls, but the Earth curves away, so it falls around the Earth. The question is how far does it have to go in one second so that uh, the Earth is 16 feet below the horizon? In figure 7-4, I think that's another figure, yeah. We see the Earth with its uh, 4,000 mile radius and the tangential straight line path that the bullet would take if there were no force. Now, if we use one of those wonderful theorems in geometry, which says that our tangent is the mean proportional between the two parts of the diameter cut by an equal chord, we see that the horizontal distance traveled is the mean proportional. Uh, I think he means a geometric mean. Um, I think, and <laughs> by the way, this theorem in geometry, I myself don't remember um, that geometric theorems are um, often very useful and it takes a lot of effort to learn uh, really thoroughly. So I would encourage you to um, try to make sense of this, maybe go back and look up your geometry books if uh, this theorem was proven. If not, you know, look it up, <laughs> see where you can find the proof of it. So what I'm saying here is that um, we see the between mean proportional between the 16 feet fallen. So 16 feet fallen, that, does, that diagram doesn't sound right. It should be drawn perpendicular. Um, um, 16 feet fallen and the 8,000 mile diameter of the Earth. The square root of um, this quantity, which is how you calculate geometric mean, comes out very close to five miles. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty sure this drawing should be drawn a little differently, but in the end, it doesn't matter all that much for these small distances. Um, if the bullet moves at five miles out, a second, it then will continue to fall toward the Earth at the same rate of 16 feet each second, but will never get any closer because the Earth keeps curving away from it. Thus it was that Mr. Gagarin, uh, Yuri Gagarin, the Russian um, cosmonaut, <laughs> was the first person to be uh, on the, uh, uh, to achieve orbit maintained himself in space while going 25,000 miles around the Earth at approximately 5 miles per second. It took a little longer because he was a little higher. Um, yeah. As is the distance fallen in one second. I'm pretty... 
Mm. Oh, yeah, I guess uh, that's the ambiguity. Um, so yeah, uh, falling, if you measure it relative to your original orientation, should be perpendicular this way. Uh, if you measure relative to where you are, then it should be drawn this way. But so this is the beauty of calculus. This is drawing, which would be inaccurate when you're dealing with the large distances. When you're dealing with the very small distances, it becomes approximately correct. Um, so, yeah. And, 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 and this is all great. And this uh, paragraph is here is where uh, Feynman uh, 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 demonstrate to how uh, how we judge scientific theories. So let me continue reading. Uh, I'm going to go back to my original view. So any great discovery of a new law is useful only if we can take more out than we put in. It's a very generally applicable statement, and it's a useful thing to consider because um, as a human beings we are uh, uh, it's in our nature to try to explain things in fact that's what early myths are it's a uh, ancient attempts at explaining the world we see you know the Jews killed the titan and <laughs> we are <laughs> the whole world is made out of the titan's body <laughs> now it explains the things but um, in those kind of theories you don't get anything out more than you put in. So you put in some assumptions, juice, killing, item, pronouns, <laughs> um, to explain things. And may what at best, what you put in is exactly what you got out. And the way we judge scientific theories and laws is that if that's all you did, then, then it's not useful because um, all it has done is basically um, explain the things that exist, things that you already knew. So perhaps you gave some rational for uh, something that didn't have rational, but how do you know your uh, rational reasoning is right? So this is the Feynman uh, de demonstrating how Newton's um, discovery of uh, the universal gravitation um, is useful in this way he described. Now, Newton used the second and third of Kepler's laws to deduce his law of gravitation. What did he predict? First, his analysis of the moon's motion was a prediction because it connected the falling of objects on the Earth's surface with that of the moon. Second, the question is, is the orbit an ellipse? We shall see in a later chapter how it is possible to calculate the motion exactly. Oh, and this is actually the part where you have to be good at calculus. And indeed, one can prove that it should be an ellipse. So no extra fact is needed to explain Kepler's first law. Thus, Newton made his first powerful prediction, reduced three laws of planetary motion down to two, um, more or less. <laughs> The law of gravitation, wait, what is, oh, the professor not giving, there are textbooks, uh, lower division physics textbooks that do go through this. And again, I'll say you have to be really good at calculus to do it. Um, I, I myself wouldn't try to do it without prior preparation because again, you have to be really good in calculus. And I'm not all that good, at, good enough in calculus to do it without prior preparation. <laughs> Okay, the law of gravitation explains many phenomena not previously understood. For example, the pull of the moon on the earth caused the ties hitherto mysterious. The moon pulls the water up under it and makes the ties. People had thought of that before, but they were not as clever as Newton. And so they thought there ought to be only one tide during the day. The reasoning was that the moon pulls the water up under it, making a high tide and a low tide. And since the earth spins underneath, that makes the tide at one station go up and down every 24 hours. Actually, the tide goes up and down in 24, uh, 12 hours. Another school of thought claimed that the high tide should be on the other side because side of the earth, because so they argued the moon pulls the earth away from the water. 
both of these theories are wrong, it actually works like this. The pull of the moon for the earth and for the water is balanced at the center. But the water which is closer to the moon is pulled more than the average, and the water which is farther away is pulled less than the average. Furthermore, the water can flow while the more rigid earth cannot. The true picture is the combination of these two things. So you have a bulge on the closer side and the farther side. So as the earth rotates, one cycle every 12 hours or so. What do we mean by balance? What balances? <laughs> if the moon pulls the whole earth toward it, why doesn't the earth fall right up to the moon, collide with it? Because the earth does the same trick as the moon. It goes in a circle around a point, which is inside the earth, but not at its center. The moon does not just uh, go around the earth. The earth and the moon both go around the central position, each falling toward this common position as shown in this figure. This is the common point, uh, very center or center of mass or center of weight of earth and moon. Um, the motion around the common center is what balances the fall of each. So the Earth is not going in a straight line either. It travels in a circle, or ellipse, which is quite close to circle. The water on the far side is unbalanced because the moon's attraction there is weaker than it is at the center of the Earth, where it just balances the centrifugal force. The result of this imbalance is that the water rises up away from the center of the Earth. On the near side, the attraction comes from moons stronger, and uh, the attraction from the moon is uh, stronger, and the imbalance is in the opposite direction in space, but again, away from the center of the Earth. The net result is that we get two tidal bulges. So, yeah, I think this is the section I want you to read through in detail, uh, mostly for this description here of uh, Newton's discovery, um, Newton's discovery and testing of the inverse square law of uh, gravitation. Um, the, this is a um, um, description of science as it ought to be. You know, we make a prediction and we test that prediction against the uh, uh, experiment uh, known, oh yeah make a prediction, make a test the prediction against um, known facts, experiment data. I guess Newton didn't really do any um, experiment of his own. He was relying on measurements made by others. And, um, you know, when they disagree, um, then we, um, <laughs> we fix it or um, we uh, maybe uh, we learn from that disagreement. So here, uh, I guess what Newton learned was well. He was a, uh, he was a, a, he was. Oh, for some reason I got the word that he was discouraged. But well, um, what discrep? So you know, he found the discrepancy and he um, thought the the theory um, wasn't correct because you know it was contradicted by existing fact. But, you know, he didn't just forget about it, uh, get rid of it entirely. And um, when he learned of an update that might change the prediction, he redid the calculation. And um, and once we had the agreement, then he published and um, all that. That's a kind of a, well, an example of how science ought to work. Um, we make predictions and uh, we test it. And, uh, you know, what to do when the um, predictions don't agree with uh, the experimental results don't agree with the prediction. That's a whole topic on its own. Um, I think uh, there are scientists who think, especially in other fields, um, who think that our, we call it publication bias in the sense that we scientists tend to want to, and the peer-reviewed journals tend to want to publish only the results that show positive uh, result, uh, kind of equivalent to, to Newton not publishing his result because he saw a discrepancy that he considered to be too large. And um, what if uh, no one never ever made a 
new distance, new measurement of distance to the moon within Newton's lifetime, um, then what would happen? So there's a in the scientific world there's a bias for publishing and making others aware of the positive result, as in uh, results that seem to show something new. Uh, when someone did an investigation and it's a negative result, as in the result didn't show anything apart from what someone would just uh, guess offhand, then because it's not considered a novel, people don't publish it. And, you know, there's a reason for that. But um, sometimes that kind of publication bias can lead to systematic bias in a field that's uh, not healthy for the field. <laughs> So that's a whole another topic, but I will um, um, I'll leave that for you. But uh, I guess uh, what I can ask, uh, if you're interested in the topic, what you can do for yourself is uh, search up something called the replication crisis, because it has to do with um, crisis uh, to a degree of um, um, where... Uh, there are some scientific results that don't seem appear to be replicable. <laughs> it's not something that affects uh, physics all that much, but it's a, you know it affects how we. It's an epistemological. It's a, a problem of knowledge gathering uh, because we rely on this scientific process, and there seem to be results that we thought were reliable but are not apparently. So uh, I'll leave that there. It's not really a physics topic. So, okay. I have like 15 minutes and uh, I wanted to, yeah. So there are some uh, portions from chapter 52 that I wanted to look at. Um, I probably won't read it through. Uh, let's see, what should I do? Um, I could just uh, start reading through and stop wherever. Uh, um, yeah, I don't really have this planned out. Uh, I guess, uh, um, well, le let me just start, um, uh, from the top and we'll, we'll um, um, we'll go from there. <laughs> So this is uh, so this chapter talks of, uh, d deals with the uh, symmetries and physical laws, and I think it, it's uh, quite apt that it comes at the end of volume one, at the end of the uh, volume dealing with the mechanics, because if uh, um, someone were to ask um, in fundamental physics research, what do we concern ourselves with? or um, the the one field of physics that's mostly concerned with fundamental laws of physics is particle physics, both experiment and theory. Um, so if someone were to ask a particle physicist, so what do you study? And, you know, they could give you the whole long description of the standard uh, model of particle physics, discovery of elementary particles, elementary laws, and all that. But let's say that's too long. You want them to describe to you in one phrase what they're studying. Then what they would say is symmetry in physical laws. That's fundamentally what we study. It... Uh, um, it, it tells us about various properties of physical laws that are useful and gives us an insight in a way that we can gather any other way. So this support picture is um, Feynman describing some of the symmetry operations. So, um, yeah, in fact, I think, yeah, so he describes the symmetry operations in this section. And uh, he said, these are kind of um, uh, transformations, the kind of, um, 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 well, transformation, how you might change something. If you imagine a, a plot on a XY graph of, I don't know, a parabola, for example, then how would you, um, what kind of operations can you do to that parabola to change it in a systematic way? And this uh, is uh, some collection of uh, transformations you can do. You can do translation. You can do take the parabola and translate it. 
you can uh, ventilation at the time is a little bit harder to pull up, grow that way, but you can imagine uh, uh, shifting in time, um, you know, take something that happens today, make it happen tomorrow, that would be translation in time, kind of. Um, rotation through a fixed angle, and um, so this becomes a bit more mathematical. This is also with the, what we consider in special relativity. <laughs> so, reversal of time. Imagine taking wherever you see time t and just replace it with a minus t, so that you reverse the direction of time. That's one. Reflection of space. Um, you can imagine looking in a mirror or. Um, uh, or you know, taking a um, kind of three-dimensional axis and inverting each one of the axes, um, that would be a reflection of space. Uh, this is okay. Getting more quantum mechanical, uh, exchange symmetry is something that you will hear described in quantum mechanics. Uh, we do mention it in physics four C. Uh, quantum mechanical phase. Uh, let me leave that alone for now. Uh, if you want to, you can look up something called the Aharonov Bohm effect. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, um, did I misspell Aharonov? I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, one effect that deals with the um, um, quantum mechanical phase. <laughs> um, and uh, matter, antimatter, uh, that's getting to the discrete uh, symmetry operations. Now, as you think of these as a kind of transformations you might do to something um, that's listed and, you know, um, for the time being, disregarding some of the operations that are very, um, very abstract that requires introduction of some uh, matter of physics for us to even to describe the operation. I want you to think a little bit about what operation is missing here. So, you know, you have translation, you have rotation. If you do any kind of image um, manipulation, like a Photoshop, you can imagine doing this, you know, translation is taking an image and moving it, rotation, rotating it. And uh, you can even do the reflection, you know, mirror operation, or most image editing software has that. I want you to think about what operation is missing here. And after you have some time to think, let me uh, read it through some of the section here. So he described this uh, symmetry in space and time. Um, yeah, so, so these are... He, um, these are the description of the uh, symmetries above that I briefly described. And he also goes into the symmetry um, under uniform velocity. So this is what's leading to special relativity. Uh, it describes that. Um, ah, so so uh, let me start um, reading from here. And this is the uh, these are what I want you to read. So let me do that. So um, um, now the above mentioned the symmetries have all been over um, have all been of a geometrical nature, time and space being more or less the same, but there are other symmetries of a different kind. For example, there is a symmetry which describes the fact that we can replace one atom by another of the same kind. To put it differently, there are atoms of the same kind. <laughs> Maybe a bit obvious, um, but we can describe it as a symmetry. It is possible to find groups of atoms such that if we change a pair around, it makes no difference. The atoms are identical. Whether whatever on one atom of oxygen of a certain type will do, another atom of oxygen of the type will do. One may say that is ridiculous. So that is the definition of equal types. That may be merely the definition, but then we still do not know whether there are there are any atoms of the same type. The fact is that there are many many atoms of the same type. Thus, it does mean something to say that it makes no difference if we replace one atom by another of the same type. The so-called elementary particles of which atoms are made are also identical particles in the above sense. All electrons are the same, all protons are the same, all positive pions are the same, and so on. All neutrons are the same. Um, 
Yeah, and and yeah, <laughs> I was going to talk about the groups that you see in periodic table, but that's uh, what you might call approximate symmetry. Uh, let me not get there. Okay. After such a long list of things that can be done without changing the phenomena, one might think we could do practically anything. So let us give some examples to the contrary, just to see the difference. Suppose that we ask, are the physical laws a symmetrical under a change of scale? Suppose we build a certain piece of apparatus and then build another apparatus five times bigger in every part. Will it work exactly the same way? The answer is, in this case, no. The wavelength of light emitted, for example, by the atoms inside one box of the sodium atoms and the wavelength of light emitted by a gas of sodium atoms five times in volume is not five times longer, but is in fact exactly the same as the other. So the ratio of wavelength to the size of the emitter will change. Another example we see in the newspaper every once in a while, pictures of a gray cathedral made with little matchsticks, a tremendous work of art by some retired fellow who keeps gluing matchsticks together. It is much more elaborate and wonderful than any real cathedral. If we imagine the, that the that this wooden cathedral were actually built on the scale of a real cathedral, 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 <laughs> we see where the trouble is, it would not last. The whole thing would collapse because of the fact that scaled up matchsticks are just not strong enough. Yes, one might say, but we also know that uh, when there is an influence from the outside, it also must be changed in proportion. We are talking about the ability of the object to withstand gravitation. So that, so what we should do is first to take the model cathedral of real matchsticks and the real Earth, and then we know it is stable. Then we should take the larger cathedral and take a bigger Earth, but then it is even worse because the gravitation is increased still more. Today, of course, we understand the fact that Phenomena depend on the scale, on the grounds that matter is atomic in nature. And certainly if we built an apparatus that was so small that there were only five atoms in it, it would clearly be something we could not scale up and down arbitrarily. The scale of an individual atom is not at all arbitrary. It is quite definite. It's determined by laws of physics somehow. <laughs> the fact that the laws of physics are not unchanged under a change of scale was discovered by Galileo. He realized that the strengths of materials were not in exactly the right proportion to their sizes, and he illustrated this property we were just discussing about the cathedral of matchsticks by drawing two bones, the bone of one dog in the right proportion for holding up his weight, and the imaginary bone of a super dog that would be, say, 10 or a hundred times bigger. That uh, that bone was a big, solid thing with uh, quite different proportions. We do not know whether he ever carried the argument quite to the conclusion that the laws of nature must have a definite scale, but he was so impressed with this discovery that he considered it to be as important as the discovery of the laws of motion because he published them both in the same volume called On Two New Sciences. Another example in which the laws are not symmetrical that we know quite well is this. Uh, um, well, I guess, I think, uh, let me just finish reading this paragraph and I think that's it. Um, a system in rotation at a uniform angular velocity, so rotating, uh, does not give the same apparent laws as one that is not rotating. Uh, if we make an experiment and then put everything in a spaceship and have the spaceship spinning in empty space, all alone at a constant angular velocity, the apparatus will not work the same way because, as we know, things inside the equipment will be thrown to the outside and so on, uh, by the centrifugal or Coriolis forces, etc. In fact, we can tell 
that the Earth is rotating by uh, by using a so-called four-cult pendulum without looking outside. Um, and and this fact uh, uh, puzzled some people. There's a uh, something called the Mach principle, which um, I, I don't know. It puzzles some people. Uh, it doesn't puzzle me, <laughs> but um, it, uh, uh, it it's a uh, it because uh, you know there is such a thing as an absolute rotation because of this um, lack of symmetry of um, with respect to rotation at a constant angular velocity, and um, this is the. Uh, um, so, so yeah, uh, this is the statement, and I don't know. <laughs> that's out there. But I, I don't know if this is something that uh, I guess. So I did take a classes on relativity, and I did take an uh, undergraduate course on relativity, which of which about a third is spectral relativity and two thirds is general relativity. And I have to say, general relativity is not something that I felt a super um, uh, super competent in. <laughs> so, so I'll just uh, leave that there. So, um, anyways, uh, but you know, this symmetry of nature um, is. Something that people engaged in fundamental physics research are um, really concerned with. And this is section 52.3 uh, describes why. Uh, he is describing here Noether's theorem, I think. Um, uh, does he not mention the name Noether? Uh, yeah. So, well, what is describing here? That there's a connection between symmetry and conservation laws. There's a, something called Noether's theorem. Uh, it's a theorem proven by Emma Noether, Emmy Noether, um, and it connects any or uh, every that makes a direct connection between uh, continuous symmetry. Translation symmetry is an example, uh, such example, and uh, uh, and a conserved quantity. So, so, so you know, in our class, conservation laws were important part of mechanics that we teach because it gives a way to analyze things more easily, and it's also important in a fundamental way because it. Um, uh, to say a particular force is a conservative force is to give a statement about its property. So, um, so this uh, mathematical theorem draws a direct connection between uh, a symmetry of a continuous transformation and and and, uh, and a conserved quantity. And Feynman is describing here. Um, um, some of the conserved quantities that uh, it's connected to the quantum mechanical phase, um, and and even though the Noether's no theorem doesn't go as far as to say when you have a discrete symmetry, there's also conserved quantity. Uh, I think the examples of discrete symmetries, as in uh, like a mirror reflection, is an example of discrete symmetry. Uh, all the discrete symmetries that we have, they do connect to some conserved quantity. I don't know if uh, that's uh, something that's mathematically provable or not, but what we observe is that that's the case. <laughs>